I'm not going to recap. They should have been here. Um, <laughs> Galatians 6.10, it says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. You got me now, Sarah? Or excuse me, Stephanie? Good? All right. So we want to be good to everybody because that's what Scripture tells us to do. But it's so important to be good to those who call on Jesus the same that way that we, that we do. You know, we split our Christianity into who's Catholic, who's Protestant, who's this other thing. What denomination do they belong to? You know, so what we try to do is we try to be good to the people who believe like us. And that's not what Paul is telling us to do here. And it's definitely not what Jesus told us to do. My life is to be a benefit to anyone who calls on Jesus as Lord. Not just to those who believe in the Holy Spirit as for today, to believe that miracles and healings haven't passed away, but to everybody. Because if I can be good to you, guess who else I can be good to? Those people who don't believe like me. And then to those people who don't even believe. And that's how we benefit the world. Not being choosy about who can get our goodness, who can get our time, who can get our finances, who can get just any part of our heart. But I can be good to everyone because I call on the name of Jesus. And that's who I trust to work through me. So John chapter 15, John chapter 15, verse 9 to 17. And some of you guys have probably never heard me speak here before. Um, I like chewing up scripture and knowing what stuff means and how it applies to everything else. So that's kind of what I want to teach you guys this morning is what is this scripture actually saying to us? And John chapter 15, verse 9 to 17 says this, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. And so that's the conclusion. Here's my, here is my new commandment, that you love one another. And guess what? We can't do it. Those disciples who were sitting in front of Jesus were definitely not in a place to be able to do it. You know, you just had a, a conversation with John and James and their mother saying, hey, Jesus, give my sons a place by your right side. And all the other disciples are like, hey, that's not fair, Jesus. They can't ask for that. We want to be there. So Jesus asking them, hey, love one another like you loved me. That's a tall order. And it can only take the Holy Spirit, to be able to do that. But let's go back to chapter, or excuse me, verse 9 for just a, a few moments here. As the Father loved me, God was well pleased with Jesus long before he ever did anything. And so then that becomes the stepping stone to our love for people. Being well-pleased, loving people long before they could ever do anything for you. Consider your children. 
for those of you who have children or who have someone very close to you? Did that person have to do anything for you in order for you to give love to them? Not a thing. And so that's just the scratching the bare minimum of how we love people. Being well pleased with them, not being able to do anything for you, having nothing to return to you. That's the way that the Father loved Jesus. That's the way Jesus loved us. You've done no mighty work. You've not gone off and, and preached in my name. You've not cast out any demons. You've not given thousands of dollars to this ministry to send the gospel to Africa and all these other places. You just said yes. And before you even said yes to me, I was pleased with you. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And then Jesus tells us to abide in his love. And I really like this. To stay in a given place, state, relation, or expectancy. So abiding in Jesus means I have an expectation of his love. An expectation of whether I do it right every time, if I miss it every time, if I hit it sometimes, and, and, and other times it's just way far off. If I'm abiding in him, I stay expectant of that love. I stay in a state where that love is always available to me. There's nothing I can do. There's nowhere I can go. Where that love won't follow me, won't track me down, won't encircle me, won't protect me, won't long just to be with me. God's love longs to be with you. You know, when we think of longing, you know, I, I, I think of when I'm away on a long trip. I was in a month-long trip away from my family, and my heart was just to get back home. Because that's my place. That's where I know I am. My family is fond of me. They're well pleased with me. If the trash doesn't go out until tomorrow, my kids are still going to love me. If that Amazon package is a day late with something I promised them, my kids will still love me. I abide in that place. It's, it's always my state. It's always where I long to go back to. And we need to have that same longing for God's love. Yes. Knowing that it doesn't, and Dad says this a lot, what you do is not what determines how God loves you. It had nothing to do with it in the beginning. It won't have anything to do with it in the middle or the end. And so Jesus has given us this promise. That if you remain in my love. If you abide in it. If that's where you find home. You're going to bear fruit. And that's what's so cool about trees. They just do it. There's no effort. There's no striving. There's no straining. They just do what they're made to do. You and I were made to be the, the focal point of God's love. If no one ever picked fruit off of that tree, it would still bear fruit. If no one ever came to you for advice, for your love, for your compassion, you would still bear fruit. Because that's what we're built for. 
And so I really want to hammer on something here in the middle here. Verse 14, it says, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. Servant mentality. All of us have it to a certain degree, right? How are you doing today? Oh, I'm just serving God the best way I know how to. But Jesus doesn't call you servant. Like he said here, a servant has no idea what his master's doing. He doesn't know how the master is growing. He doesn't know how his business is going. He doesn't know how his master is, you know, extended into the community and, and building. A servant just knows his feet are dirty, I better wash them. His clothes are dirty, I better wash them. A servant's whole life is do, 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 do. But what can a friend do? Enjoy everything that the master's doing. He can be taken into the heart of what the master is doing knowing the master's plans, knowing how the master is planning on impacting that community, what he's building, what he's tearing down, what he's expanding into. So I would encourage you, don't think of yourself as servants any longer. A servant's always on the outside, trying to see what's in. A friend's on the inside with no way out. And Jesus calls you friend. Once again, not because of anything that you've done. He calls you friend. Verse 13. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. And, you know, this verse does mean me being willing to die for my friend. Me being willing to lay my life down. And as I was kind of thinking about this and, and meditating on this scripture, I'm thinking, you know, I'm not in a situation where I could die for my friends. We live in a pretty great nation. I can still worship the way I want to here. I can go to the church the way I want to. I can speak Jesus in the mountain and in the street. Um, and my life's not at risk. So how do I lay my life down for you? How do you lay your life down for me when there's no threat of, of, of death? And, and what I'm, I'm led to, to consider is I put down me to pick up you. You know, Pastor Dan has shared that a couple of times is, you know, a lot of the times the church is trying to rally around the dreams of the pastor. He's trying to rally around your dreams. That's how I lay my life down for you. That's how you lay your life down for me. That's how we lay our lives down for each other. What do I have that can lift you up? What do you have that can lift me up? What do we have that can lift up this community? Because if we're reading this scripture the way that Jesus intended for us to know it, your life is of way more valuable value than mine from my point of view my life is of way more value in your eyes than yours is but we don't think that way we don't believe that way also my belief is tied to God okay what can you do for me today what are you moving me to do today that can make my life better. 
Where can I go that puts me at an advantage? And this place, this church, all of our churches should be a place that just uplifts everyone. A scripture that always stuck with me over the years is, you know, Jesus made a really simple statement. The poor you'll have with you always. And that triggers compassion in me. I know I can't solve that problem. But what can I do to impact it? I don't want to just take one person off the street. I want to take multitudes off the street. I don't want to just lift up one part of my community while the other part of it falls into you know, just despair and and, and loneliness. So I lay my life down for a greater cause, for that love that is is trying to come alive in me so that I can give it to you. And so we can be just receptacles of God's love. And I love prayer, but prayer does not take the place of action. You know, I was reading Galatians 10 in, a, in, in the Weiss translation, and it was saying, you know, let us be having opportunity to do good. Opportunity is always there for us to be doing good. Are we letting ourselves take advantage of it? Do I have to check my bank statement before I give to church? Do I have to check my bank statement before I give to my friends? You know, and dad spent spent several weeks talking about stewardship. You know, how we're stewarding the kingdom. And that comes back to our love. If I'm being a loving steward, there's nothing I have that I won't give away. Because it's not mine either way. It's easy to give the kingdom. In our words. And what we have to do is make the connection of how do we give the kingdom in our deeds. That it's not about what's in my, in, in, my, in my bank account. It's not about what I currently have in my hands. If you guys came and looked for cash for me right now, I would not have it. I don't keep money on me. But what do I have that I can give? I can give you Jesus, yes. That's easy. How do I give you my life? And so that's my challenge to you guys this morning as far as your prayer. You're praying about what you need or what someone else needs. Are we only praying about people's needs when they come to us with them? Or are we praying, let me be what is able to fulfill someone's need today, Lord? Let me be the healing hands that goes somewhere today, Lord. Let me be the compassion that goes somewhere and does something good for someone. That's how we fulfill the needs of people around us. You know, I can spend 20 hours a day praying for all of you and you never see a thing. While it's just sitting in my home. Hey, I need a new pot. Oh, I just bought a whole set of pots the other day, but let me pray with you. You know, my car could really use a wash today. All right, well, let's pray that somebody gives you a call out of the blue and comes wash your car. And I really hope that what I'm saying makes sense. We have so much more to give. And and 
don't take this disrespectfully because I don't mean it this way. We have so much more to give than just Jesus. It gets them into the kingdom, but how do we keep them there? How do we keep ourselves in that love? We keep ourselves in that love by doing for people. We keep ourselves in that, that love, staying connected to the kingdom by going. And one of the things I was thinking about, you know, growing up, you know, a lot of families had trouble with their kids. And that was kind of expected in, you know, being raised Pentecostal. You know, you had some good kids and you had some really terrible kids. You know, so there was a lot of, hey, we're going to pray that, you know, if there's something mentally or emotionally going on in them, gets gets made right. But one of the things you never saw was, let me be a mentor to that kid. Let me take them out. Let me go hear their story. And we can do that for people. Not just on Sunday mornings where I have them for 45 minutes and I try to get them to digest quickly a very quick message on how they should be loving their parents and how they should be obeying their parents and how they need to do good to their parents. And Your Sunday afternoon to your Sunday morning, how do I impact you? That's what Jesus is getting to. Turn with me over to 1 John 3. First John 3, uh, verse 16. So First John 3, verse 16 to 23 says this. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before, toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And in verse 17, it talks about, if I see you with a need and I shut up my heart, so that means that my heart becomes obstructed. Love can't get in, love can't get out. And the only way we can break that type of obstruction is to love like Jesus, to give up those goods. And it reminds me of the, the story of the rich young ruler. What did Jesus say to him at the end? Go sell all that you have and then come follow me. And that's a tough task. That's a tough ask. But what we've been learning about, about God, about Jesus, is that when we give, he gives bigger. When we're possessed by possession, we're obstructed. God can't get anything new to us. God can't get anything out of us. You know, I do my same old giving. If a guest speaker comes, all right, it was okay message. Here's 20 bucks. 
you know, there's a need in the church. Well, you know, Melody's got a little bit nicer jewelry than I do, so she might be able to afford to give a little bit more. So I'll just depend on her to do that part. And those are kind of the motions that our hearts go through, right? And John talks about how our hearts become condemned. You guys ever lived with a condemned heart? Everything you did, just you know it's just not going to go right. You put your hands on it, you know it's going to go poorly. That's what a condemned heart is doing. It's souring everything that you do. And then you find the next thing, and you work hard, you give 100%, you do it with the best of your ability, your expectation is for it to go poorly. And so just kind of going back to that, you know, talking about bearing fruit. You know, when, when an apple tree bears fruit, it's not saying, oh, man, limb 217 on the right side. Oh, I could have done better with that. It just bears fruit and it calls it good. And so our hearts need to get back to the place where we just call it good. Because John uses this word assure. And persuasion is not something that just happens, right? Persuasion is something that over and over and over, I become more persuaded. Okay, I gave my best effort. It's going to work out good, but I hope it works out good. All right, this next project, I gave my best. I did everything that I could. Okay, that last time didn't go 100%, but I got 80%. Okay, this is going to go 90 and then that next thing, okay, this is going to get better. And we just keep persuading our hearts and persuading our hearts that it's good. I can be a direct object of God's love. I can be the hands that heal. I can be the feet that go. I don't have to check my, my bank account any longer to know what's in there. I just know that it's got finances and whatever I have is going to be useful. And we just keep persuading ourselves. You had to do it with Jesus, didn't you? Just because you said yes didn't mean everything just opened up to you. You had to go in and find that scripture on healing and meditate on it and chew on it until it became alive in you. You had to go in and find that scripture about, okay, if I tithe, it's going to be returned back to me. It might mean one less outing this week, but I can do it. And you persuaded yourself to give. You persuaded yourself to pick up the phone to, hey, do you have a need? Okay, I can meet that. And assurance, to me, assurance is, is about knowing, once again, how loved you are. My kids go, tonight, go to sleep at night, every night, knowing how loved they are. And they sleep 10, 12 hours, and I'm fighting for six. But that love makes them comfortable. It's not the air conditioning. It's not the 
500 thread count sheets. <laughs> you know, it's, it's simply knowing when I wake up, it's good. When I'm in the middle of my day, it's good. When I'm at the end of my day, it's good. I might have gotten some, some, some discipline throughout the day. Dad might have liked how I did this thing, and I had to be corrected. But you know what? That correction was for my good. You know, and one of the things that I love about where I am with my kids right now is uh, it's been a few years since I've had to spank my children. My word's good enough. And that is a phenomenal place to be as a parent. Yeah. <laughs> Or your word is just good enough. And that's our relationship with God. Have you made his word good enough? You know, where you're not thinking, well, man, God sent me that, that flat tire for a reason. I got to learn something. That sickness didn't just come from nowhere. I, man, I really should have spent an extra minute in prayer. That's not how God moves. That's not how he loves. That's not how he wants to flow in your life. I don't build confidence in my kids by kicking them down the stairs and saying, well, this will teach you balance. But we get to those places sometimes, right? We get to those places sometimes where we think that, okay, if something's going poorly in my life, God must really, really be trying to get a hold of me. And the worse it is, the more he's trying to get a hold of you. And there are people who believe like that. And somehow that brings them comfort. I, I, I can't get my, my head there. But at some point in time, you've probably been taught something of that nature. And it may not be as extreme as, okay, God put me in this car accident so he can teach me to slow down. But that coffee table wasn't there yesterday, and my toe really hurts right now. (laughs) Those silly things that condemn us, right? Those silly, those really, really silly things that cause us to... Just, just for that moment, just to doubt God's loving nature towards us. And that silly thing becomes a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And then your friends got to hear about it. I redecorated the, the living room yesterday, but that coffee table wasn't there. And now I got to go to the ER and, and waste a bunch of hours there to see if my toe's broken. I should have called you yesterday and just told you how much I loved you. So this is me doing what God is telling me to do. And that's so wrong. That is so wrong. But that's the condition of a condemned heart. I find every little thing I possibly can. Well, because God's shoulders are big enough, he can take that, right? He can take the responsibility of me not doing everything right. I can blame him for, you know, the the lack of health in me right now. I can blame him for the lack of health in my family. And that thing happens to you. And you guys all know what that thing's going to be. It's already talking to you. (laughs) 
Or are you going to get down about what you need? I love everything that I have from God. I'm not smart enough. I'm not capable enough. I, according to this world, I'm not the right color to be successful, to have the things that I have. None of that stuff matters. God has made me the focus. He has made you the focus of his love. And he proved it through Jesus. Historical fact that Jesus went to that cross and died. And even if you're a skeptic, that happened. He was raised to life on your behalf. Seated at the right hand to give you a place there. I'm not trying to get to where I already am. I need to abide there. I need to stay in that place. I can't get moved off of that place. That's why they always called God a rock in the Old Testament. Rocks don't just move. Mountains don't just move. They are a part of the very fabric of this world. And that person has chosen to set his love on you. Verse 23, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he, is, he gave us commandment. It's not a hard commandment, but you can't do it on your own. You can't try to do it on your own. And at the beginning, I kind of talked about, you know, how we, how we kind of mix up who to believe in and who to love. And so what the scriptures are telling us is believe in Jesus Love people. It's hard to do. Because we, in our humanness, we want to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, strength. That was the old commandment. And we want to believe in people. Because we want to think the best of people. We want to know that, okay, when I give that $20 to that person who came in and gave that special message, they're going to do something right with it. It's going to get them to the next place to go continue to deliver the gospel. I'm not paying for that guy's meal for the night. It needs to go to Jesus. And God, my body's hurting right now, but I love you so much. You need to heal me. I've done all these things for you. I've given, I've, I've fought hard. I've kept the faith. I love you. Heal me. And it sounds good in prayer. It sounds phenomenal. Because I love you, you should do. But what he's telling us, all across the New Testament. You know what I'm going to do? Because you believe. Because you believe in Jesus, that is access to everything that I have. That's access to the healing that your body needs. That's access to my kingdom coming alive in you. So believe in my son, go love people. Because if you love people, that's how you connect to my love. That's how you show that you love God. It's not about saying, God, I love you, over and over and over. It's a great song. 
but it's impractical to what the Word is telling us to do. We're not commanded to love God and to believe in people. That belief has taken a lot of people and put them in the poorhouse. That believing in people has led a lot of people into a lot of heartache and a lot of pain. But you know what love can do? Love towards people? It can make you test them out. It can help you rebuke them when they need rebuking. It can help you provide correction to that person when they need correction. God doesn't want us to be taken for fools. God doesn't want you to be taken for a ride and be hurt by people. And that's why he tells you to love people. And I was looking at a story where Jesus is telling his disciples, you know, the Son of Man has to die. After three days, he's going to be raised again. And Peter says, no, 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 no. You're not going to do that, Jesus. And Jesus rebuked him for it. And his statement to Peter was, you are not mindful of the things of God. That's what love can do. Keep us all mindful of the things of God. And when you step out of being mindful of the things of God, I can love you right back into it. I can love you back into being that man or that woman of God that you're called to be. And so... Let me finish up with 1 Peter 1.80. You don't have to turn there. It says, Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We love God through loving people. We believe on him and we receive the fullness of that salvation our deliverance, our prosperity, our, salva- our, our safety, excuse me. Honoring that name sets me free from everything. And it sets me free to be able to love people. It sets you free to love your husband or your wife, even though things might not be going great. It sets you free to love your children and your family, even though things aren't going great. It sets you free from the judgment of your own heart. So, you want to love God today? Love people. Amen. You want to receive answers to your prayers? Believe in Jesus. They're extremely difficult things to do. It's an extremely difficult commandment to live by. And we need the the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in us to be able to do it. And guess what? He's more than willing to. He's more than willing to make your life so much more than what you expected of it. Because many of us didn't have high expectations for our lives. We were a part of those not many wise, not many strong, not many rich in this world that Jesus laid his life down for. But we have been given power to go after the wise, the mighty, the rich in this world. Not because the riches that we contain, but the belief. Everybody needs this message. Everybody needs this gospel. This gospel of a kingdom that doesn't fail, 
this gospel of a love that was proven through, through death and through life. That's what we take into this world. You know, Paul said to some, we're going to be the stench of death, and to others, you know, just the, the aroma of life. But be life. Be life through your love. Be life through your belief. Amen? Thank you, Lord.